Hey there, everybody. This is Senator Katie Fryhester, broadcasting from my home kitchen in Ellicott City, Maryland. And I'd just like to welcome you all to our webinar today um, on Code Girls, Cybersecurity, and Women. I am really pleased that we have um, with us, we have New York Times bestselling author, Liza Munda. You wanna wave? Hi. <laughs> okay. And then we also have uh, Dr. Linda Singh, you want to wave? Okay. And um, we have Laura Nelson of the National Cryptological Museum Foundation. Um, and then we have some support staff who are helping us all. This is the first webinar I've ever done, but it's going to be great. Um, so anyways, I just wanted to give you guys, um, uh, just remind you that the purpose of today's call uh, is to you know, hear about these great women in World War II who um, helped break the codes and, and played their part in World War II winning the war. Um, I also am just hoping that with all these great women online, we can inspire more women and girls um, into the cybersecurity field. As many of you know, I uh, sit on our Education Health Environment Committee, but I also chair our Joint Committee on Cybersecurity, IT, and Biotechnology. This is a growing field and we need every single person who's interested to get involved. Um, so we are going to um, uh, divide our, our webinar today into three parts. We're going to start off with uh, Dr. Linda Singh giving us her perspective um, in the state of Maryland. Then we're going to turn it over to, um, to uh, Liza Mundy. And she's going to spend, um, she's going to do a really great presentation specifically aimed at you know, our high, schools, high schoolers who are here. Um, and stop frequently to ask some questions. And then um, wrapping it all up, we'll, we'll have uh, Laura Nelson. Um, and uh, we do have, I just gotta say, uh, you guys can't see each other. We have 250 people, you know, everywhere from Alaska to Idaho to Florida, New York, New Jersey, Maryland, Virginia. And we may even have some people tuning in from Europe. So. It's really an exciting time to be online with all of you guys. Just in terms of this technology, um, what, uh, you guys can probably see the Q&A button at the bottom. And if you click on that button uh, to ask a question, we will do our best to answer it. Um, and if we can't answer it online, we'll follow up with an email. We did each receive probably a dozen questions for each presenter. So they're weaving those into their, um, into their um, presentations, and I will also be asking them some as well. So with uh, that, I would just like to turn it over to uh, Dr. Linda Singh. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you so much, Senator. I really appreciate it. And I want to thank you for allowing me just to share a little bit about, um, you know, what I think about cybersecurity and where we are today, because I think it's, it's very important. And it ties directly back to what Liza is going to talk about um, in terms of World War II. And if you think about the times of, you know, or can imagine anything that you've read about World War II and what was going on during those times. And then think about the time that we're in right now with this pandemic. Um, it was very, very critical for us to, to really rally around uh, looking at our overall skill, skill sets. And cybersecurity wasn't called cybersecurity then. Um, right, so it was really focused in and around coding and, and all of the different aspects. And so when you think about how it has evolved over all of these years, we're finding ourselves still finding it, um, still seeing that it is extremely important that we need more people who understand the importance of being safe uh, in the, the cyberspace and what it takes to be able to do that. I mean, if we think about just the capability of Zoom, um, you know, everybody started moving to the Zoom platform and we found that um, it was not one necessarily designed for the magnitude that it took on, but two, um, we had to be very careful about the cyber aspects of it. So um, when I think of how important it is for, for young women and even young men to really focus in on um, the skills that they need very, very early on. That hasn't changed from World War II to now. And those skill sets are the science, the math, um, you know, those technology fields, looking at how you start shoring up your foundation very early on. 
and then continuing to grow that. And the thing that I've found over my career, whether it's on the military side or the civilian side, um, it, it really doesn't matter whether I'm a, a, a hardcore coder or whether I am a functional analyst where I'm doing the analysis that actually gets passed off to a coder. Um, I think, you know, what's so important about that is I am seeing, and, and I'm sure, you know, others probably have seen that having that technical capability, having the ability to analyze is a skill that we need to put into every field and concentration. It's a skill that we need in life. And so if you were to take, um, you know, those hardcore coding courses very early on, even if you decide that you don't want to be in that field, it's going to give you some analytical abilities to be able to go through and do some problem solving. And so what I love is getting young, uh, you know, young people involved in coding earlier and watch them progress as they continue to get older. And I find that their analytical abilities are a lot stronger. And, and you know, when I think of, you know, what the military does in and around um, this particular field and here in Maryland, if you don't know a lot about the Maryland National Guard, um, you know, the Maryland National Guard has um, some of the, the most amazing cyber forces, um, you know, within the 54 states and territories, but most importantly, a good number of those individuals who are, are what we call part-time, uh, you know, warriors, um, they also work at some of our amazing, you know, three-letter facilities like FBI, um, DEA, um, so uh, NSA, NGA, right? So a number of those, those places. And, you know, they are really the best at, at what they do because they do it full time and then they bring those skill sets to the military side. And so for me, you know, my coding background started um, way, you know, probably 20 some years ago where coding wasn't what it is today. Today we, we do um, a lot different types of codes. There's a lot of different programs that makes it a little bit easier. You can actually use code generators. Um, back in, in those days, I was actually starting in on coding into ADA programming. Uh, I'm not real sure how many of you would even have heard of, of ADA on the phone, but if you actually go out and, and search, it was one of the, the program, programming languages that was used a lot in the Department of Defense. And so, you know, when I think about that time and then what it's allowed me to be able to build in terms of a career, I, I, it has allowed me to go through and develop a systems implementation background, right? Systems integration, where I have implemented systems across about 15 different federal agencies uh, for a consulting company. And then bringing that back into really the military side, it's really allowed me to be a better leader. And so when I think just in terms of what we're seeing today, the threat is real and, and we need more skills. Uh, we need more individuals that want to get in and really get their hands dirty and learn the technical side of things to really then help to bridge, um, you know, that language with the functional capabilities. And, and so, you know, if you are thinking about, you know, well, how is it applicable to me today? Well, every individual should be worried about, um, you know, how they operate in, cy in cyberspace. Now we're doing classes online. We are online more than we ever have been because of the environment that we're in. And that does make us subject to trying to be a little bit more aware. And so, you know, with that, um, Senator, I hope that that gives, you know, everybody just kind of a, an overall view and kind of sets the tone because what you're gonna hear from World War II is very relevant for today. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Singh. And we do have a few questions for you um, that, that um, but I think actually this one was for, for Liza. So maybe we'll come back to them in a, in a second. But the, the, the question was, if it wasn't called cybersecurity back in the day, what was it called? Which is a great transition. So Liza, I'm gonna pass it over to you. And if you wanna do a part of your presentation and stop, we'll, we'll ask some questions then too. 
Sure, thank you so much. That was a great, uh, great introduction and a great lead into this talk. Uh, and I, I do have some slides that I'm going to show to conjure up the historical era of World War II. And one of the, um, I think one of the important principles to remember is that so much of our STEM field was pioneered during World War II. Uh, as, as we may reflect on today, periods of crisis uh, often prompt innovation. And World War II was certainly a time when there was a lot of innovation in the field of early computer work and, uh, and early STEM work. And because the men were fighting, because the men were at war all over the world, uh, women were drafted into these efforts. And it was, it was often women who were pioneering our STEM fields. That's certainly true of cryptanalysis, uh, code breaking, and, uh, and code making as well. That would be, I think, the early, um, the early term for, uh, for cybersecurity, because these women were, you know, they were hacking enemy communication systems, and they were uh, they were protecting our own systems as well. And I'll also add that, in addition to being an, a book author and a journalist, I'm currently a scholar in residence at the Center for Cryptologic History at the NSA, uh, researching uh, what a number of these women did in their professional fields after the war, because a number of them went on to become really top officials at NSA working in the field of cybersecurity and pioneering that. So I'm working with historians there to sort of continue the story of the Code Girls uh, after the war. And um, I like to start my presentations by, uh, by talking to you a little bit about uh, the, uh, I'm, I'm about sort of the world that these women uh, inhabited right before the war and, uh, and how, how they experience something that I call like a Harry Potter moment when your when your life changes uh, in an instant in a way and you suddenly find that you've been ushered into a field and a world that you had no idea even existed. They sort of like the characters in Harry Potter who got their uh, their secret letter. These women were suddenly in some ways, you know, told you thought your life was going to go one way, but uh, in fact, you're going to become magicians. Uh, and and as opposed to being magicians, they were told, you know, that they were going to learn how to become code breakers. So uh, so I start with this this photo of women who were graduating from Goucher College in. Uh, in the spring of 1942. And it's important to keep in mind that in 1942, only 4% of American women got a four-year college degree. There were so many colleges and universities that were closed to women. Uh, and there were so many fields that were closed to women. Even if they got a four-year college degree, most fields would not admit women or, or many women at all. Uh, if you got a great college degree in 1942, the only job you could expect after that would be teaching school. And that's great if you want to be a school teacher. But if you want to be a doctor or a lawyer or an architect or uh, go into the STEM field or, 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 or a businesswoman, you're going to be shut out of graduate schools and shut out of professional networks. And so there wasn't a big economic incentive even for women to go to college. So these women who were attending Goucher, which was a very well-regarded uh, woman's college at the time, it's now a very well-regarded co-educational uh, university in the, in the Baltimore, Maryland area, and they were far more unusual than even they realized, just in the fact that they had gone to college and they had achieved a great liberal arts degree, studying uh, English, uh, French, physics, math, a very rigorous education that entailed both uh, sort of, you know, the language arts and the mathematical and scientific arts. And, and so the other thing uh, about women going to college at this time is that because the fields of endeavor were so limited, they also were under a lot of pressure to get married. And one of the, one of the reasons that a family might send a girl to college if they could afford it coming out of the depression was so that she would get what was called her MRS degree, so that she would meet a man at a neighboring men's college and get married. So in the senior year, there would be all these rituals to sort of usher women basically into the marriage market. Uh, and they were under a lot of pressure to get engaged or even get married before they graduated. 
situated. And so you see these women, these you know, top high achieving academically oriented women who are uh, members of what was called the May Court. There were a lot of May Court spring ceremonies at women's colleges across the country, uh, really to symbolize kind of that they're being ushered into the marriage market now upon their graduation. Uh, but what I love about this photo of the Goucher women is that two of the women on this platform had already been selected for a completely different future, uh, and they had been tapped by the U.S. Navy to become code breakers. Uh, and so the woman whose uh, face is circled, Jacqueline Jenkins, after the war, her name would be Jacqueline Jenkins Nye, mother of Bill Nye, the science guy. Uh, and so that gives you a sense of her intellectual abilities. And her friend, Gwyneth Gaminder, uh, who you can see there, they had been secretly selected by the US Navy uh, to learn this arcane field of, of code breaking. And when I'm talking to students in particular, I, I like to ask, you know, how many of you at some point in your, uh, in your childhood or your career as students, have you created a secret language that only a friend or a sibling can understand uh, and that you hope the enemy can't understand it? And then, you know, in that case of kids, it's the enemy is usually parents or teachers. Teachers, right? You have something urgent you want to communicate to somebody else and you don't want somebody to listen in to. And so that's a very, very human impulse. Almost everybody does that at some point in their life. And of course, Politicians do it as well, diplomats do it, military leaders do it. During wartime, communication is essential as you're you know, planning movements and, uh, and, and strategies and trying to understand what the enemy is planning. There are all these secret communications that are taking place, particularly during wartime. And in that case, you know, the enemy is the enemy. The enemy is the other side. And so uh, these women were drafted into the code breaking effort because a few, a few months before their graduation, we were attacked at Pearl Harbor. It was a terrible surprise. We didn't know the attack was coming. It exposed our lack of intelligence capabilities. At that point, we didn't have an NSA. We didn't have a CIA. We didn't know what the Japanese were planning. That was the event that propelled us into World War II, propelled the United States into World War II, which had already been raging in Europe for more than a year. And so all of a sudden, we're in global total war. Men are shipping out, young men are shipping out practically the next day. They're on convoys going across the Atlantic Ocean to Europe, where Hitler uh, and the Germans have now invaded and occupied most European countries. Uh, they're on, men are on aircraft carriers in the Pacific Pacific, you know, um, fighting the Japanese who've now attacked us. So it's just, you know, we're in a crisis period now, but we should remember that this was just, this was a period of massive surprise and crisis and that the American public rose up and met the challenge. The military knew we had to build our intelligence capabilities and our abilities to listen in to enemy signals and to know what they're planning. So when I was doing my research for Code Girls, I found a document in which you can see uh, a light bulb moment going on uh, in the US military's head, basically. Uh, you see, this is, a, this is a document that the US Navy generated to show where it was getting its code breakers. Even before the war, there was a small group of people who were listening in on enemy signals and learning how to break those codes. Uh, the Navy would recruit men from men's colleges before the war, but of course, those men are suddenly unavailable. And so you can see, uh, on one side, you can see the kind of training the code breakers were getting but on the other side, you can see that they're, they're talking about where they're getting their code breakers. And you can see the light bulb moment where a naval official says, if the young men we would normally turn to to do this work are unavailable to us at the very moment when we need thousands and ultimately tens of thousands of code breakers, let us turn to women. Let us see what educated women can now do to serve their country and to learn how to break these enemy communication systems. And so that was a really important tipping point for women ultimately for women in the military, and certainly for women to go into the field of intelligence and what would eventually be called cybersecurity. And as a result of that light bulb moment going on, um, both in the US Navy and the US Army and the US government, uh, that these young women were called in, and this is what I call the Harry Potter moment. These young women were called in uh, for secret meetings with their professors and uh, 
they, if they were good at math or science or English or languages, they would be called in one by one uh, in top secret meetings and they would be asked two questions. Do you like crossword puzzles and are you engaged to be married? And if they answered no to the first, uh, yes to the first, I like crossword puzzles, no, I'm not engaged to be married, then they would be invited to take a secret, a secret training course that was developed by the US government. Both the Navy and the Army were competing for women. The woman you see here, Dorothy Braden, was actually a school teacher recruited by the US Army. So the Navy was going after women at women's colleges. The Army was going after young school teachers uh, and, and inviting all these women to sign up for top secret war work to come to Washington, D.C. to serve their country. Uh, Dot Braden, my central character, arriving in Union Station in Washington, D.C. in 1943, taking a cab to a place called Arlington Hall, where the U.S. Army code breakers were, um, were quickly housed in massive temporary buildings. Uh, and these women came to Washington often with even no idea yet what the top secret intelligence work was that they'd be doing. Uh, and when they got to Washington, their welcome to Washington was to be told that they were doing incredibly important top secret work. They were gonna be very hastily trained and that they couldn't tell anybody what they were doing. Of course, you don't want the enemy knowing that you're breaking their code systems. And so the women were told once they signed their loyalty oath to the US government and agreed to keep their work secret, uh, their welcome to Washington was being told that they would be shot. If they told uh, anybody what they were doing, it would be an act of treason during wartime. And also uh, that if anybody asked what they did in these giant code breaking compounds, they were to say that they were secretaries, that the work they did were, was unimportant. And you know, up until then, people had re often regarded women's work as, as less important than men's. And so in a way, they were the ideal intelligence workers in the field of intelligence uh, uh, because people would just assume that the work they were doing couldn't be that important. And in fact, it was vitally important. And it was one of the major reasons that the, the allies would ultimately win World War II. So I'll pause right now and, uh, and take some questions if there are any. There, there are a few. Um, can you guys all hear me? Okay, great. Um, so somebody asked a question that, um, what is a MRS degree? And is that part of a four-year college? So I think we should answer that one. And then another person. Yeah, now I've heard actually from my own daughter that, that the term MRS degree, and that's not why she went to college, but uh, uh, is still talked about. So um, the MRS degree was a joke uh, that a woman was going there to become married because uh, the students listening may or may not remember, but when a woman gets married these days, and certainly when she got married back then, she would become Mrs. Uh, so and so and so she would get her MRS. That's the you know, that's the abbreviation for Mrs. So uh, the, so the joke was that women were actually going to college to get married. And uh, and that often wasn't the case. I mean, many of the women in my book who I interviewed, you know, they ultimately wanted to get married and have a family, but they didn't want to have to necessarily get married right away. And uh, and they were under enormous pressure to do so. And the uh, the opportunity to come to Washington and to do this vitally important war work, to use their college degrees, to use their abilities and their brains in service of the nation, uh, offered them a completely different future than the one that had been presented uh, to them up until then. And of course, it was a time of enormous fear and crisis as well, and they were very, very eager to serve their country. That's a great, great answer, good joke to, to share with everybody on the line. Um, we also have another question here, which is, um, a question that we got both in the registration process, but it's been asked again. So given that these women were sworn to secrecy and they couldn't tell anybody about their jobs as in coding, how were you able to get this information from them in order to write the book? So by the time I interviewed these women, most of them were in their early 90s. Uh, and they had kept this secret for, you know, for 70 years. And in fact, the, the story had been declassified back in the 1990s and books had been written. Many of the people watching this webinar might have seen The Imitation Game, which tells the story of Alan Turing and the British and the breaking of the uh, German Enigma cipher, which was one of the most important uh, cipher systems during World War II. The Allies broke it uh, and many of the women worked it. Uh, so, so the story got 
out, but nobody had tracked these women down and told them that it was okay to talk. Uh, and keep in mind, there were more than 10,000 women ultimately who came to Washington to do this work. You can see this is just one classroom here of former school teachers being taught the geography of Asia as they're learning how to work the Japanese code systems. Uh, so so there were there were thousands of women doing this work and 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 the vast majority kept the secret for their entire lives and often i did have to convince them that it would be okay to talk and it did take me a while to convince them but some of them realized that the story was out that movies like the imitation game were out there that books were out there and that they had been written out of history uh you know it's like the women of hidden figures the uh the the African-American mathematicians who powered the space race. They had been written out of history until that book and movie appeared. And the same was true of the female code breakers. They had simply been ignored. And so many of the women, while they had kept the secret, they were also very, very uh, glad to finally get some credit. Cool. I'm going to ask one more question, which maybe you could answer shortly and then move on. And I also want to um, ask Dr. Singh to respond You know, after this presentation. But um, the question is, you know, looking at this photo, um, what was the rough statistical number of women in minority groups? Uh, and what might have been the cause of this? And does it have any correlation towards coding towards female students today? And I think that, um, you know, I, I'd really be curious, you know, after, after you answer this, to hear from Dr. Singh um, about, um, you know, whether she experienced that at all in her decision to go into a traditionally male dominated, um, you know, career. So the U.S. Army and the U.S. Navy, which were mostly running our code-breaking operations, were um, were segregated during World War II. Uh, and so there was an important African-American code-breaking unit. It was separate from the unit, you can see that every woman in this photo is, is white. Uh, it, later on in the presentation, I have a photo of the African-American unit and they were working the codes and ciphers of the private sector. And so this is interesting to think about. Uh, many of the code breaking operations were of course working military, political and diplomatic code systems. Uh, but there was also a lot of coded communications taking place in the private sector, uh, which is true now, right? Whenever we make a financial transaction online, and, and this is where cybersecurity also really comes in for all of us. Uh, whenever we're ordering something from Amazon, ordering grocery these days, uh, or doing any banking, we need for those communications to be encrypted, right? We need for our financial information, our credit card numbers to be secret encrypted. And that was true during World War II as well. A lot of communications travel by telegraph or radio, you know, or by more Morse code through the air. They were either traveling through telegraph cables or through the air. So they were vulnerable, just the way the, uh, the internet is vulnerable these days. And so companies and banks would also use coded communications in their telegraph cables. And, uh, and so there was an African-American unit that was assigned to work the codes and ciphers of the private sector of banks and companies to make sure that nobody was doing business with Hitler or that nobody was doing business with Japanese. Japanese companies like Mitsubishi uh, because they were the enemy and we weren't supposed to be doing business with the enemy. And so while uh, the units were segregated, uh, there was this very important African-American unit. Again, most of them women, most of them former school teachers, uh, many of them from historically black colleges and universities, you know, women who had achieved their education at a time when the barriers and hurdles were even higher, but who were also very important to the founding of the cybersecurity field. Right. Dr. Singh, do you want to really quickly uh, talk about, you know, this this issue of, uh, you know, discrimination and working in a male-dominated field, and then we'll go back to the rest of Liza's presentation? Right. So I, I think it's, um, you know, when I think of uh, coming into the military in 1981, which is when I, I joined, um, women had not too long uh, been actually integrated into the field of military, at least into the Army side. And so we still had, uh, while we were integrated, there still was a lot of differences in, in up until a number of years ago, differences in the way that men and women were, were looked at. You know, women were put more in administrative type fields. Um, we were, were not put into the roles of uh, what we would call combat roles, uh, which has changed significantly today. And so 
when I think of just in terms of overall discrimination, and for me, you know, when I went into the military, I didn't think about it. I, I um, went into the military out of a need, um, and, a, and it was a need to be able to make money and get training and, and to kind of get away from where I was. And so uh, I grew up around a lot of males, and I think um, what has transformed for me is that when I became an officer, I became a whole lot more aware of the challenges and issues that were going on around me that sometimes I didn't always always see. And so we still have a, a tough time today, but we're seeing more and more women, you know, in roles as you know combat pilots, um, they're infantry officers, they're special forces. I mean, the field is completely open now, um, you know, to women. And what we're finding is that you know the women who want to be in those roles are just as capable as the men. And and so you you really have to think of the evolution that we've been able to come through has has it's been pretty amazing kind of not only being a part of it but then also watching um this evolution to where you know women are are being seen even i think more today as as equals right but we still have a long ways to go i'm not saying that we're, we're completely there we have a long ways to go but we've seen a huge huge movement Thank you, Dr. Singh. Let's go back to Liza. Do you want to go on to the next portion of the presentation? Yes, and again, that's a great uh, that's a great segue. Just to just to um, elaborate on that, when uh, when Dr. Singh talks about the integration of women into the military and the opening up, it was really a reintegration because World War II was a tipping point. It was the first time that women were uh, allowed to join the military in, uh, in significant numbers. It was a very, very important breakthrough for women. Uh, the Army code breaking unit, which you see here, would be uh, civilian for the most part. But I'll show you some photos shortly of women being um, uh, coming to work for the US Navy and they were allowed to join the Navy uh, or invited to join the Navy and very, very eager to join the Navy. Uh, the caption here, pencil push and mom is thank the shipping of Japan, just to talk about some of the really important uh, uh, code breaking successes that the women worked on. You see these vast rooms of women. I mean, just, just as I said, ultimately thousands of women. This is the army uh, unit, so it's civilian. Um, when you think about, when students who are listening think about all of the messages that each of us, each individual person sends every day by email, by text, by Instagram, Facebook messages, all these wireless communications, communications that even one person sends all day long, you get through through all these different channels for all of us. Uh, think about wartime and think about every military commander, every politician, every diplomat, all of these banks and companies, they too are communicating wirelessly doing using all sorts of different signals. They're they're using radio. For the most part, they're using radio, sending it through the air, scrambling their messages. The Germans are using this machine called Enigma that looks like a typewriter, but it scrambles the letter of German letters of German messages using all sorts of different permutations. Uh, the Japanese diplomats have a big, big machine that scrambles the letters of a Japanese messages that has that has been written out first in uh, in Roman letters but the Japanese are also using numerical code systems in which uh, a word like supply ship will be rendered as a five digit code group and then five more digits will be added to it to encipher or encrypt it so they have all these different methods of making codes and ciphers all these different reasons for having to send messages messages, and there are just an unbelievable number of systems that these women have to learn how to break, uh, how to work these code systems, and breaking a code system System has two meanings. Uh, somebody like Alan Turing, uh, who you might have heard of, who figured out how the Enigma system worked and how we could break that system, that's, that's breaking a message system on a macro level. Uh, but then there's the daily breaking of each individual message that has to be done uh, on a micro level, uh, and the Germans are changing the design and the key of the machine, so it's not an easy task, and these women are doing it 
all day long, every day, and leading to some of our major successes in World War II. The breaking of the German Enigma cipher meant that we could protect our ships as they went across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, they were being preyed upon by German U-boats who were being directed by Admiral Donitz using that Enigma system. We were able to see where the U-boats the, the were and steer around them. Uh, and meanwhile, in the Pacific, we're breaking the code systems of the Japanese army, which is spread out all over the Pacific and has to be supplied by supply ships. So those school teachers you saw sinking the shipping of Japan, and that was a, a poem that they actually wrote, Pencil Push and Mama Sink the Shipping of Japan. They were breaking the code systems that said where those ships were going to be so that we were able to wait with submarines and sink those ships. And the Japanese army couldn't get the supplies that it needed. We were breaking the code and cipher systems of the Japanese Navy. I'm just showing these photos so you get a sense of how many women in how many different rooms were doing this work. There's the African-American unit uh, hacking the codes and ciphers of the private sector. Uh, and now you'll see some of the women who joined the US Navy and they were uh, stationed at a different compound in Washington, DC. You can see them in their naval uniforms uh, in the Navy now. The, the women who had gone to college were naval officers. Uh, but this was also a moment when women who hadn't been to college College could enlist in the US Navy. And if they tested high for intelligence and the kind of aptitude, pattern seeking aptitude and persistence that are required to tackle these code systems every day, the enlisted women who hadn't had the ability, that who hadn't had the advantage of a college education could also come in and work these code and cipher systems. Uh, you see stacks of Japanese messages there. You have to make an incredibly important decisions about which ones are important. As the allies are pushing back, uh, you know, through the Pacific Ocean, uh, these very dangerous amphibious landings on, you know, uh, trying to retake the Philippines, all this territory that the Japanese have captured, the island of Guam. Uh, the women are supporting that effort and the women now are members of the US Navy. So, uh, so this was a massive entry of women into the US military. Uh, and then what happened after the war, after all these successes, and you, you see here actually some of the code uh, worksheets that they were using. Uh, we didn't have computers quite yet. We had some early computers that we, we, we were developing, but uh, the women had to do this with pen and pen, pen pen and pencil and paper and their brains, uh, collaborating with each other, working these systems. And then after the war, again, they were under enormous pressure. They were told, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your service. You helped us win the war. You must never talk about what you did because we're gonna head now into the Cold War. We're gonna be breaking the code systems of uh, you know, the Russians and other communist countries. We don't want anybody knowing that we can do this. So the women were told, even after the war, not to talk about what they did, which is why they didn't get credit. And I have a couple of photos here so that uh, the students can see their personal lives. Um, during the war, they were writing a lot of letters. They were sending vital messages of their own to uh, to to soldiers, you know, to their brothers and their boyfriends and their fiancés. And then after the war, they're under a lot of pressure to leave, to leave the workplace, to make room for the men who are returning from the war. They're told, thanks very much for your service. Now it is time to get married uh, and to, you know, start families. Um, I, I sent this, this is uh, the school teacher that you saw at the beginning of the presentation, Dorothy Braden. That's her on the, uh, on the sand sending, um, uh, they sent a lot of photos to the men overseas as well. And it just shows that there's nothing new under the sun, right? The, the selfies and the texts and the tweets that today's students might send to their friends and also their uh, significant others, um, uh, boyfriends, girlfriends, whatever, uh, that they were doing the same during World War II. And so a lot of these women after the war left the work, uh, sometimes because they wanted to, but often because they were told they had to leave the work after the war. And a number of them who were really dedicated to the work stayed on. Often those women didn't get married and have families, because if you had a family, you were expected really to, to stay at home with your kids. And uh, the government had provided childcare, free childcare during the war. That stopped after the war. And so even the women who wanted to continue on often couldn't. And, and that's why there had to be this 
reintegration uh, of, of women uh, and, and certainly minorities, people of color into the, into the STEM workforce in particular in government and the military uh, many decades after the war. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop there again and, and take any questions. Yeah, I've got, I've got a lot of good ones, Liza. Uh, let me just list all the questions and maybe you can consolidate a few of your answers. Um, so uh, first question, why would they take photos of women doing top secret work if they could have been leaked? Second question, did the German counterparts have as many women working as the US and the UK? Um, Third question, who is considered more valuable for jobs like these, women or men? And did the men do code breaking too? And then um, if these women were sworn to secrecy, were the men also sworn to secrecy? Um, did they keep the confidence or they claim credit long ago? <laughs> so, okay. So uh, I'm trying to hold those in my head. Uh, the, the great question: Why they took those photos? Those photos were classified for for decades, and only now are they available at the National Archives. and uh, And so, I think they did want to document what the efforts were like, but they uh, they kept those photos under lock and key for decades after the war. Um, I'm sorry. What was the next question? Oh, oh. The point about the German counterparts. And, and oh, that's a great, and that's a really important question. Uh, you know, one of the reasons, there are a lot of reasons why we won World War II. It wasn't foreordained. You know, we didn't know we were going to win. And our ability to, you know, our, our industrial capacity, our ability to build ships and bombers was part of it. But our willingness to be what we today we would call inclusive. You know, it wasn't perfect, but the bringing in of um, African-American pilots, uh, the Native American code talkers, the Navajo code talkers, the men who could speak the Navajo language, uh, and women. Our ability to include uh, people who had been discriminated against before the war and, and were to a certain extent discriminated against during the war, but we availed ourselves of our full national talent pool. That is something that the Allies were willing to do, that the Axis powers like Germany and Japan were not willing to do. Germany did not have female code breakers on the level that we did. Japan certainly did not. And so uh, when we're trying to understand today and make the argument for the importance of inclusiveness, it's important to look back and see who won World War II and why, right? The Germans were killing and exterminating a portion of their population uh, rather than availing themselves of the talent of all their citizens. And that is something that the Allies were willing to do imperfectly, uh, but, but to a much fuller degree than the Axis. So that's a really important point. We did have mail code breakers. Uh, the, the men were often working in the field of battle because women weren't allowed uh, into the field of battle at World War II, certainly not in the same numbers. Uh, there were men who were doing code breaking on site and they were working closely, you know, by um, uh, through our own coded communications with the women who were often back in Washington. Although there were there were women who traveled with the U.S. Army and who were in Europe and in the Pacific and who even followed the soldiers onto the beaches after D-Day in order to handle our communications, in order to make sure that our communications were coded and more secure and weren't being hacked as we were pushing through Europe. Thank you very much. Um, we've got about two or three minutes before we're in a transition, so why don't you try to go through the rest of the presentation? Yeah, I just wanted to show, I think I wanted to show a couple of videos of the women uh, just so that students could get a sense of, of their voices and their personalities. Uh, and I think I'll, I'll just do two uh, and hopefully it won't take longer than two minutes. So the first person you'll hear hopefully is Dorothy Braden, the school teacher who was recruited to work for the Army. So I can't hear her. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so maybe we should stop that, and I can just tell you that she's uh, that she's talking about her first um, her first train ride to Washington and how excited she was and how you know she was assuming that Washington would meet her with open arms, uh, and in fact, what she was told when she got to Washington was that she had to find her own place to stay and that she would be shot if she told anybody what she was doing. So, uh, so that's, um, that's what she's saying. And then uh, this is Ann Seeley, who was recruited by the US Navy. Uh, to, that worksheet that you saw, that was the kind of work she was doing. 
And I just want to, I'm sorry you can't hear their voices, but I do have a website, lizamundy.com. And anybody who wants to hear their voices can go to my website and all these videos are on that website. Uh, the last woman, and I, I don't know if it's going to advance to her video, um, but Dorothy Ramali is, uh, she's on my website and she's important because she was training to be a math teacher. Uh, she, she remembers getting up in the middle of the night to watch all of the men in her math class. Uh, you can at least see her here, even if you can't hear her. She remembers seeing all of the men in her math class being rounded up and put on a bus to go to Pittsburgh to go to be inducted into the U.S. military, you know, to ship out. And that was very important. And it was at 2 o'clock in the morning that the Army sent a bus to get these. I don't know. It seemed to me it was all of the men, you know, that, that there were no men left in the college at that time because they all had to go, I think, to Pittsburgh. You see, since I was taking mathematics, a lot of times uh, I was one of maybe two girls that were in the classes, you see. So I knew so many of the fellows that were going on that bus. Uh, I'll never forget. And just the final thing I'll say, what I love about Dorothy Ramali, I mean, she was, she, she got tears in her eyes. 70 years later, remembering the sight of those men uh, in her math class being taken off to war. Uh, and also what I love about her is she aspired to be a math teacher. And that was a hard job for a woman to get at the time. Often women weren't hired to teach math because math wasn't considered a woman's field. Uh, and she would go on after the war to be a public uh, math teacher, uh, public school math teacher. She taught at Swanson Middle School in Arlington, Virginia, which is the own, which is the middle school that my own children would later attend. And that shows, I think, you know, how few degrees of separation there are between most of us and these women who served and didn't get credit for it. Uh, and I love to think of these seventh and eighth graders, you know, taking Ms. Ramali's Algebra One and Algebra Two class, uh, having no idea that this sweet, kind woman who many Arlingtonians remember as the best math teacher they ever had, uh, without knowing that she was a, if I may say it, a truly badass code breaker during World War II. Uh, she worked both for the U.S. Army and then she was um, actually recruited by the U.S. Navy uh, and, and they dangled an officer's housing allowance in front of her. She got an extra $50 a month. And that also meant that she was able to qualify for the GI Bill after the war because she was in the US Navy and she was able to get a master's degree using the GI Bill and make a little bit of more money from the Arlington public school system. And so again, I think of these women as the hidden figures of World War II, uh, the hidden figures of the greatest generation. And, uh, and they remind us that these STEM fields, these fields of cybersecurity, uh, you know, cryptanalysis, they were, they were pioneered by women uh, as much as by men. And uh, this is a field that women and owned at the very beginning. And, and, and students today should know that as they're trying to figure out whether this is a field that would be receptive to them, that, that we've been there all along. Oh, thank you so much, Liza. I'm gonna get tears in my eyes too. <laughs> um, I'd like to turn it over to Laura Nelson now that we're really um, excited and we all wanna go into cybersecurity and cryptology. And Laura, you know, I wonder if you can tell us just a little bit about your role and um, your plans or vision for how the U.S. can kind of best train and prepare, um, you know, our youth and what the opportunities are uh, for folks who uh, want to uh, get more involved and learn more and take on a career in this area. Sure. So um, I started my career at NSA um, and spent 37 years there. And I was an, I'm an electrical engineering major. So I entered, um, you know, uh, similar to D General Singh, or Dr. Singh, I entered into this world of a male dominated world. And, and um, it was like the other thing that she said that was very interesting to me is I didn't even think about it at the time. It wasn't until I was there, I said, oh, you know, there's a lot of men around and I'm working with a lot of men now. So um, um, women were not in leadership roles at the agency at the time. So I saw that evolve over time, over the years I was there. And it was just refreshing as you saw more and more get into leadership positions and you know, take prominent positions in the, in the agency. Um, upon retiring, I guess I was offered my dream job and that was to become the CEO and president of the National Cryptologic Museum Foundation. 
hopefully some of you out there have had the opportunity to, to visit the National Cryptologic Museum. It is uh, owned and operated by the National Security Agency and sits right on, the, on federal property just, just outside their gate. Uh, the foundation was created to support that and their efforts. And then at first it was about acquiring artifacts and providing some financial support for things that the government couldn't provide to the museum. But uh, since then we've really evolved our role and we're, and we're, we're on a campaign now to build a new museum. And this, um, this new museum is gonna be in the same location, but it's gonna be much more than that. It's gonna be a cyber center for education and innovation, and it will become the home of the museum, but it's gonna have a lot of other things as well. Uh, um, conference center, it's going to have classrooms, it's gonna have a rare books library, has, have many things that will be, you know, open, and it's gonna be open to the public. So I'm hoping that a lot of you out there will have the opportunity to visit the museum as it exists today, but then in the future, think about how, you know, go to this new museum. Um, my background, I chose my background, as you see, that's a, it's gonna be exhibit in the new museum. Um, this is the bomb, which was, you know, our, our, our computer, the first computer that we used during uh, World War II. And um, this is what it's gonna look like in, in its, when it becomes a new museum. So um, some of the things that uh, we think about, when I think about cybersecurity and the next generation, uh, we really need to build cybersecurity from the beginning, from kids. They need to have that as their mindset and everything that they do. In other words, we teach kids, you know, be wary of strangers, stay away from strangers. But just the same, you've got to think about what you're doing, you know, what your kids are doing and what, what you're training your kids to do, that they really need to think about their own safety, their own privacy from the youngest of ages, from the minute they touch the internet. They really need to think about that. And then when it comes to, you know, education in schools, we really need to push that into the low, you know, the lowest levels. We need to get it down to the elementary school level and, um, and train kids in how to, how to prepare them for this cyber and interconnected world that we have. Um, from our foundation's point of view, we have some programs underway to do that. Uh, we are working on a high school uh, curriculum, uh, cybersecurity curriculum framework that um, we will be pushing out you know, across the nation. So we have the first phase of that done, but then what we're going to do in the future is um, populate that with real content that teachers can then use to teach, teach students. Um, yeah, oh, so now my slides are up. And here we can see, when you look at um, this, the building that's on the upper left up here, this is what our new museum is going to look like in the future. And then, um, and then as we talk about our, our education programs, we, um, we have a lot of things that are available today. So kids today, so many of you may have heard of Gen Cyber. These are camps that NSA sponsors through grants and um, that, that kids can attend, camp, uh, can attend camps to learn their basic cybersecurity skills. The other is Cyber Patriot, which is um, hosted by the Air Force, and that is where kids can do um, cyber competitions. But also um, the museum itself offers a lot of opportunities and you need to go to our website at www.cryptologicfoundation.org and you can find out all kinds of opportunities that kids can do today to, uh, to get involved, whether it's a STEM night or it's Pi Day, uh, which unfortunately was canceled this year, but in the future we'll have that. Um, the other thing that we do, and we've advanced our slides here, the, um, the virtual museum tours with our, our telepresence robot. On the left, that's Friedman. Um, named for Elizabeth Friedman, and uh, who was a cryptologic uh, pioneer, and um, Friedman can take you on tours of the of the museum today. So if you want to contact us, we can arrange for you to take a virtual tour of the museum, and you can see a lot of the things that uh, that um, were talked about in Code Girls. Some of the some of the exhibits, like the the Enigma machine, you can get in there and you can touch and feel the Enigma museum. So this is um, the Enigma machine. Um, and then, of course, there are also field trips and real live tours once the museum is open again after this, uh, after this pandemic. Um, anyway, I'll leave it at that and see if there's any other things that you might want to ask. Thank you so much, Laura. We actually do have a lot of interest in the museum. And I think because we've got such a wide uh, group of participants from all over the United States um, and some in Europe, they just want to know like what's what state is the museum in and now of course they can see the link but just give us a heads up where the museum is sure the uh, museum today as we said is open uh, the original museum is there and open today well it will be open again once once the pandemic's finished but that's something you can tour and visit today but we are building this new one and we're hoping to break ground in the fall 
we're, we're dangerously close to getting there and we think we can put a shovel in the ground. And if that's the case, it would be just over two years before the new one would open. We're really excited about it because we have a, a great exhibit designer, Ralph Ippelbaum and Associates, who has done all of those designs uh, for the exhibits. And uh, they've done other museums such as the Holocaust Museum, as well as the um, New Museum of African American History in Washington. So it's, it's gonna be a fabulous, fabulous facility. So it's here in Maryland, right? Correct. It's at Fort Meade. It sits, it sits on Fort Meade, but you don't have to go through any gates. It's almost like you're entering into the National Security Agency, but you turn off just before you get there. And it sits right outside the gates of NSA. Excellent. Thank you so much, Laura. That was great. So we've just got about five minutes left, and I wanted to ask each of our panelists to answer uh, kind of a general question. So a lot, of, a lot of people have asked us, you know, what inspired you to become an author and write co-girls? What inspired you to become a general? What inspired you to become a politician? So um, I'd like us all to try to answer that question. And then the other question is, are there current programs um, that we can direct our youth towards in addition to the museum? Is there something online? Is there a course? Is there a camp? Like, what, what, what ideas do you have? So I'll, I'll start with this. Um, with what inspired me to become a politician. And then I'll, I'll turn it over to whoever wants to go next. Um, you know, basically I've always been a problem solver and um, you know, I became an ag bioengineer because I wanted to solve problems and be part of the solution. And um, I never ever thought I would be a politician and I still don't, I consider myself a Senator, but <laughs> I don't think of myself always as a politician. But I saw, um, I saw an opportunity for state governments to become more and more important. And there were some local issues, uh, some state issues that I wanted to try to get in on the front end. And so that was really why I switched gears, uh, you know, 20 years into my career. And, and um, I don't think anything could have really prepared me for it, but I would say that being an engineer in a room full of lawyers is a lot of fun. Um, who would like to go next? Raise your hand, please. I'll, I'll be happy to, um, I, one of the things I reflected on a lot when I was writing Code Girls is how grateful I am that I was fortunate to be born into a family where both my mother and grandmother had gone to college, uh, they, and they had both gone to women's colleges, uh, and uh, uh, at, at w wonderful women's colleges at a time when you know, that was really the only kind of college education available to women, and I took that for granted in some ways uh, and, and really ceased to take it for granted once I realized how very unusual that opportunity was for women uh, in the, or, you know, for much of the 20th century and, and certainly before that. Uh, and and I, was a, I was a big reader when I was a kid. And, uh, and I remember going to the library when I was in middle school and I was specifically looking for books about women and women's achievements. And the only thing I could find back then was a series of on the wives of Henry the eighth and uh, and I read it because that was all there was but you know things didn't work out very well for uh, those women and I, um, I I couldn't really find much else and I'm so happy now to live in an era when there are these books coming out hidden figures um, code girls there's a great book called rise of the rocket girls uh, just all sorts of women also books about women Rosalind Franklin uh, you know uh, who pioneered work on DNA, uh, so many women scientists. There are so, we have much work to do. Uh, Hidden Figures has been just so wonderful um, in also convincing publishers and the movie industry that people wanna hear these stories and read these books. Uh, and so I, I'm very grateful that there are so many more examples out there for young women coming up. And Code Girls in particular, I found out about this story when I was talking to a couple of historians, actually a curator at the museum, the Cryptologic History Museum, Jennifer Wilcox, and a historian at the NSA in the Center for Cryptologic History, Betsy Smoot. I sat with them and they told me this story uh, of the of the code girls and I couldn't believe that it hadn't already been written and I want to give a shout out to federal historians to curators at, at these museums and all also to federal historians many people don't know that our our federal agencies have history offices and these are you know trained objective historians who whose job it is to tell the story of their agencies the triumphs the disasters whatever you know to give a balanced objective 
uh, view of the history of these agencies. And for journalists and book authors like me, they're an invaluable resource. Uh, and the minute that I heard this story, as I said, I couldn't believe that it hadn't been told. Uh, there were a lot of barriers to finding the women and to finding the records, uh, but I certainly, I certainly wanted to, to try to tell it. And, and spending time with these women was for me, you know, one of the most moving and meaningful experiences of my career. Thank you, Liza. Dr. Singh. Thank you. Um, so for me, um, I did not really join the military to wanting to be a general because I joined the military enlisted and without a high school diploma at the time. And so my education has progressed over the years. So I, the, the overall, you know, thing for me was the military provided me the ability to put, um, to be able to have a job and to have a roof over my head. And so as the years progressed and I started getting my education and things completed, I realized um, that I was going to have the opportunity to continue to excel. Uh, I think when I was asked to put in my packet for general officer, it was actually a shock to me because it came sooner than what I was expecting. I, I was projecting that they would not ask me for another two years and it came while I was uh, on a deployment in Afghanistan and, and they had asked me to put together my packet. So what you have to you know, realize is that that is years and years and years. It's almost you know, 20 to 30 years before you can get to that point of becoming a general officer. And, and for me, I lit a dual career. So I also was a, a very senior person at a consulting company, a, a partner at a consulting company. And you don't rise to that level without having a number of years but ways that you all could get involved, I think if you went out and looked at code.org, that's code.org, um, there are um, ways in which you can go out and give your hand a try at different levels of coding. Uh, each year in December, there's a, a program called Hour of Code, and um, we support, uh, or at least I support Hour of Code along with a number of of other uh, organizations and entities. And here in, um, in Baltimore, um, last year they did it, but the previous year before I uh, left out of the guard, we had uh, over 350 volunteers from the guard to be able to support Hour of Code through all the different schools. And so I would say that that's one of the places that you can go and start. And then the last thing I would, I would leave you with is that you know this year, is an important year. I mean, obviously it's gonna go down in the history books because of the pandemic, but this is the 100th year anniversary of women having the right to vote. And as we're talking about the census and we're talking about the importance of women and the role that we play, you know, women make a huge impact. And, and believe it or not, they actually control and can swing the way that votes go. So it is important that you understand what your role is and being able to not only do the census and making sure that you're filling that out, but also going out and, and voting. And so that's where I would leave that. So thank you, Senator. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Laura, any closing comments from you? You're on mute. I had to find my mute. I know, I got it. Um, no, the only thing I would say is uh, it's interesting because I ended up, you know, why did you become an engineer? And I think the thing I would say is that um, I had great role models and uh, I had a physics teacher who encouraged me and my father was probably the biggest figure in, you know, father, it was a great father figure. And he, he taught me, he kept saying, you need, you need to take the skills you have and you need to use them and you need to become an engineer because that's where all, that's what, you know, you're great at math, you're great at science and you seem to love it. So I think having somebody at home who really pushes helps young, young women get into the field as well. Um, and I think you know, that's uh, one of the things you also wanted to say, let me just say one more thing. You talked about um, what other opportunities are there for uh, students to get involved in um, some of these careers. Uh, all of the IC agencies offer internships, some of them for high school. I know NSA has some high school internships for their work study program, but also some summer internships where you can come in and spend 10 weeks in the summer studying some problem at NSA. 
there are many for the, at the collegiate level. So, you know, you need to look at all of those IC agencies and see what's available, but also don't forget the contractor community also offers a lot of those types of internships as well, both for large contractors and some of the smaller contractors that work at the, um, at the intelligence communities. And with that, that's all I have. Great. Well, um, we're about at the top of the hour and I had a few last questions, but they're mainly about finding the link for the virtual tour at the museum and finding the link to some of these resources that um, that just mentioned. And so we will send out a follow up email um, to everybody who registered for today's call. And I, I you know, I'm, I'm ending this call feeling very inspired to be um, to be here with all of our, our panelists. I'd like to thank you all for making time to make this a reality. And um, like we still have, you know, 150 people tuning in. So I want to thank, you know, all of you for listening um, and for, you know, playing your role in helping uh, to, to educate, get educated yourself. Um, and especially in this important year where it is the 100th anniversary of the women's right to vote. And if you're in the seventh congressional district, there's one coming up. So anyways, we'll be in touch over email. Thank you again and stay safe out there. Bye-bye.